Hey, my name's Tom, aka Elephant. I'm here today at DBS, and we're going to be looking at some of the new features in Ableton Live 12. Instead of just like going through a boring list of features and just going through a checklist and showing you things, you can just go on the website and see that. We're actually going to just make some music and look at how some of these tools are useful in making music in Ableton. The first thing you'll notice uh, right away, if you're familiar with Live, the interface is just kind of smoothed over nicely. It looks pretty much like what you're used to if you're used to Live. Just everything is a little bit cleaner. So let's start out and load up an instrument. Um, I'll just load up uh, an 808 drum kit here. And we'll start by creating a beat. So I'm going to start just with like a really basic pattern here. Cool, something super simple. I want to come up with an interesting kick pattern. I could obviously program in some, some notes here, but I don't really have an idea of a particular kind of pattern that I wanted to create. Um, and one of the sort of major new features in Live 12 is this thing called MIDI tools. MIDI tools help you generate and transform MIDI data. And they're really useful for coming up with ideas or taking ideas that you've got and transforming them in different ways to find new ideas. You'll notice in the, the MIDI editor uh, over on the left-hand side here, I've got these two tabs, Generate and Transform. And the way these work is there's a number of different kinds of generators that are tailored towards creating different kinds of material. And we'll, we'll see sort of a couple of these as we go through and create different parts. Each generator kind of works in its own particular way. Rhythm generates rhythmic patterns for particular notes. So for example, I can choose the note that I want to generate something for, let's say the kick drum. And then I have various parameters here that define the notes that get generated. So for example, if I set this to, cool, 16th notes is the duration of my steps and how many steps do I want to create? And what you'll notice is as soon as I start adjusting these, MIDI notes appear in my clip. Um, there's kind of two ways you can work with these generators. Either they can be operating in real time where as you're making changes, the notes are changing. Um, and that's with this generate on. If I leave that off, Nothing's happening as I change the controls, and I can hit this button to generate some notes. I'll do this in the real-time way, where I can kind of adjust stuff. And I'll just do it while the clip is playing. And you'll see how I can cycle through like various different rhythmic patterns just to sort of get some ideas. So I can set things like, how many steps do I want to fill this pattern? Do I want this pattern? I want this pattern to be 16 steps long, let's say. And in those 16 steps, I want to have six kick drums. And then I've got this pattern control, which I can cycle through a bunch of different variations. Uh, another new MIDI tool that we have access to in the piano roll um, lets us transform sort of existing notes. So if I've got these hi-hat patterns, I can hold down Alt and E, and you'll see I get this uh, sort of different cursor, and I can click and drag up or down on a note to split that note into different divisions. So this is really cool for creating interesting rhythmic patterns really quickly. So if I just want, oh, hold on, sorry, Alt E. There, or maybe I want a really kind of fast roll. I'm actually gonna turn the tempo down a bit. And that's kind of cool. It's an interesting little hi-hat roll there, but I want to make it even more interesting. So I'm going to go over to the transform tools. So generate creates new MIDI notes, transform tools take existing MIDI notes and do various things to them. And again, you'll see there's a, a number of different ones here that you can, can work with. Uh, I want to use one called time warp. Time warp takes a selection of notes and stretches their time in interesting ways. So at the moment, all of these hi-hat notes are equal lengths, but with time warp, I can sort of accelerate or decelerate the notes. You can hear how it sort of slows down, creates this kind of interesting rhythmic sort of roll pattern. I also want to make this beat a little bit less repetitive. It's just the same beat over and over again. So I'm going to add in a couple additional notes. Let's, let's add in some extra kick drums here. But I'll select those kick drums, those new ones that I've just added. And you might be familiar, because this has existed in, in live for a little while, with note chants. 
where you can set the probability that a particular note is going to play. So by default, everything's on 100%. It's always going to play. But these kick drums that I've selected here, I don't, I don't want them to play every time. So I can open up the note uh, chant here, which you'll see it's had a sort of slight redesign to the way it looks. But it functions mostly the same. And I can pull down the chants for these notes. Maybe I'll even do that for the hi-hats as well. Select all these hi-hats and pull them down to like 90%. So just every now and then it's going to kind of leave out a hi-hat. In these rolls, if it kind of leaves out the first hi-hat but plays the second hi-hat, the timing can sound a bit jittery. What I want to have happen is either I want the entire roll to play or not, uh, nothing plays in that particular part. So what's new in Live 12 with this note chance that we can do is you can create what's called uh, note groups. So before, every single individual note had its own chance, and there was no way to kind of link them together. But what I can do is I can select, say, this whole hi-hat roll here. And if I right-click on that, you'll see this, this option to group notes, or Command G. And now, it's very subtle, but you'll notice that instead of a little circle, I have now this sort of diamond across all of those notes. And I can define a chance for that whole group of notes to play. So either they're all going to play, or none of them are going to play. So I'll turn it down like quite low. The, ch the chance today is just rarely wanting to play notes. I'll do it with these ones as well. And just kind of group them together. So Command G. There we go. So it's kind of every now and then it's sort of leaving out that roll. So some really interesting things you can do with that. Like another example might be maybe I want to add a drum fill so that at the end of this loop there's going to be a fill that plays, but I don't want the fill to play every time. So I'll program in something like this. But I'll select that whole uh, group, press Command G, groups those notes together. And now that fill is just going to play every once in a while. So we're going to have this loop just kind of playing as we build some stuff on top of it. So I want to make it a bit interesting so it's not just going to be the same every time. So we've used some of the new kind of generate tools, transform tools, some of the note chants. Let's make this uh, beat sound a little bit more kind of punchy and aggressive. We'll go over to audio effects and grab one of the new audio effects in Live 12, which is called RAW. RAW is a distortion device, but it's a, a pretty advanced distortion device. There's a lot that you can do with it. This is kind of the heart of the device here. We've got various different distortion modes. So I've got just like kind of regular soft saturation, digital clipping. So kind of conventional distortion or saturation modes to some more sort of interesting ones like polynomial, fractal, or even like this noise injection. One of my favorites is this one called Shards, which adds these kind of like glitchy noise sounds to it, which is pretty fun. I'm actually gonna go back to this soft sign. But what I wanna do is I don't wanna have the whole drum beat distorted. I just wanna kind of have the kick drum driven in one particular way, and then maybe I'll uh, affect other elements of the beat uh, slightly differently. So. What you can also do with RAW is at the moment we're in single mode, where I've just got a single distortion. I can switch it to be in various different modes, including, so I've got like parallel, where I can have multiple distortions, mid-side, or multi-band, where I can affect different bands, uh, different frequency bands independently. So for example, if I just want to distort the kick drum, just get a nice kind of boomy 808 kick drum. And what's also quite cool with RAW is I can click this button to pop up the device and work with it in full screen and see all the parameters of the device, which is particularly cool when you're working in this uh, multi-band mode. You can see all the different frequency bands. But maybe I'll go over to the hi-hats here. And I'm going to set it to this shards mode. In fact, I'll... It's sort of here, it's kind of glitching a little bit between the left and right speakers. So you can do some really interesting things with this. I won't go into kind of all the depths of what you can do, but you would have noticed as well that we've got two LFOs, an envelope follower, this noise oscillator, which you can use to modulate all of these parameters of the distortion as well. So you can get pretty nuts with RAW um, and create some pretty wild sounds. We'll see, maybe we'll use it on, on something else as well. It's got some built-in compression. 
So I just wanna compress that beat a little bit. It's even got this uh, built-in feedback where you can feed some of the distortion signal back into it. And you can even tune that. So you could make that kind of your baseline if you want to. And what's great about it is it's, it's versatile enough that you can do kind of crazy wild distortions or just use it to add a bit of kind of color and flavor. If you've ever had to uh, go into this samples category before in live, you'll know it can be a bit of a pain to navigate. There's just a ton of different samples in there. Let's say I wanna find, I wanna get an electric keyboard sample. If I have to dig through all these samples to try and find that, there's a lot of stuff going on in here. This basically collects all the samples that exist in Ableton into one place. You could sort of use the search to maybe find things, but you, we would have to do some digging. Now, in uh, the browser in Live 12, we have this new filtering and tagging system. So any section within the browser, whether it's in your samples, your drums, audio effects, you'll see you have this filtering section up at the top. And this allows you to filter these categories based on various different terms. For example, maybe I'm looking for a sample. It's gonna be a one-shot sample. It's going to be pianos and keys, electric piano. And that's filtered um, all those available samples down to only electric pianos. All the kind of built-in sounds that come with packs in Ableton uh, are all pre-tagged so that you can quickly search through them. But you can edit and add your own tags as well. So up in the top right here, there's this edit button. So there's a number of sort of built-in categories of tags, things like the type of sound. Is it an instrument? Is it a loop? Um, different characters. And to tag something, all you do is you select it in the browser. So if I, I'm like, that's lo-fi and vinyl, you just add that tag. And then if I'm searching for something lo-fi and vinyl, that's gonna show up. You can also create your own groups and your own tags as well. So you can go in and tag your own instruments. You can tag the pre-tagged things in different ways um, if you want. You can even save particular searches. So if I am regularly looking for electric piano one shots, I just hit this plus button and it adds that into the browser. You can give it its own name. You'll see I've, like I've created one for myself called New in Live 12 where I can just remember everything that's new. But there's this pre-saved search of those electric piano samples. In terms of the sorting and organizing here, there's no um, like automatic tagging of your own sounds and samples. Um, it's just the ones that come built in with, with live. Oh, okay. However, there is another feature um, which I was, was sort of gonna look at, which is called sound similarity search. And so this is something that's also new built into the browser. I'm like, cool, I, I quite like that electric piano sound, but I wanna find something roughly similar, but a little bit different. You'll notice when you have a sample selected, there's this extra little icon here, which is sound similarity search. And when you click that, it will, uh, Live will automatically show you samples and sounds that are similar to that sound you had selected. So here's the original one. That's a preset, another preset. And it kind of sort of ranks how closely they are. So these are all, there's a lot of presets in there. That's a different sample. There's a loop different sounds. And sound similarity search actually works based on uh, sample analysis. So there's some behind the scenes sort of machine learning stuff that happens that analyzes um, samples, including your own samples, and uh, uses that to sort of link their tonal characteristics when you do the sound similarity search. As far as I'm aware at the moment, that's not applied to tagging. One, one might hope that at some point in the future they've kind of got that basics there in terms of sort of analyzing the samples. Maybe they will bring that into. I can actually see, because you can create these sort of uh, tag categories, there's potentially a different way to organize the browser where you actually just get rid of all the collections, you hide all of these, because you can hide different ones, and you just use these custom filter setups, and there you kind of are using them like collections, but you're not limited to seven. So, they, so those custom ones, you can put anything out of the browser in them? So Yeah, so you, you don't, the way they work is you don't kind of drag things into them. It's basically just a, it's a, a preset filter. So this particular filter here is one-shot samples that are pianos, keys, and chord phrases. So if I wanted something to appear in this filter, 
I would have to tag it with one of those things. So if I went, I don't know, let's do something completely random, this AU band pass, if I wanted that to appear in there, I'd have to go in and find, uh, but you'd have to add, yeah, you see what I, what I mean, you'd have to add that tag to it. I really want to remove that because I don't want AU band pass to show up in my electric pianos. Um, but that that's, would be the way that you would approach it. And because you can create your own tags, you could just, in theory, create a tag that is like a collection and you just add that to everything and it sort of replaces collections. What I really hope they, they do, which would be super fun, but I'm not holding out too much hope, is uh, let you set like custom icons for these would be pretty cool. Instead of just, because they all have this little shape. If they gave you like a selection of little mini icons you could choose, you could have one that was like your synths and one that's your samples and that'd be pretty fun. But. So there's lots, like all in all though, the filters just add more options for organizing things is what I find. Some of you might have used Granulator 2, which is a, a very popular Max for Live device. It's been around for a while. It's a granular synth. That's been updated for Live 12. It kind of functions in a very similar way to the way Granulator always has, but it's got this sort of nice new skin. So the way that this works is we load a sample into it and it's gonna sort of break the sample up into these, these little pieces called grains and then play them back in interesting ways. It's great for creating like pads and atmospheres. So the first thing I need to do is find a sample. So I'm gonna go over to the samples category in Live. I won't go into sort of the depths of granular synthesis, but essentially, as I mentioned, it takes these chunks or these grains of the samples and plays them back overlapping one another. So here's my original sample. You can hear how it's playing back the small sort of grain of the sample and looping it. But you can do interesting things to it where you have the playback position sort of slightly randomized. You can add some variation to it. Add a bit of stereo spread. So I've turned that electric piano sample to kind of an interesting pad sound. You can even record samples directly into the granulator. So if you hit this IO button, you can set it up to receive audio from an external track. Maybe you can live sample from a, a hardware synth that you've got record it straight into the granulator and immediately kind of build the sound out of it. And I'll head over to the instruments and grab another new instrument in Live 12, which is called Meld. The kind of core idea behind the Meld synth is we've got two oscillators that we can work with or two sound engines that we can use to generate sound. And each one of those sound engines has various different sort of, uh, well, they're called engines, these sort of wave shapes that behave in, in different ways. And each of them have these two macro controls that let you shape the sound. So just as a basic example, I've got here basic shapes. If you know anything about sound, we've got like a sine wave, triangle wave, saw wave, and I can sort of scroll through those and adjust a tone parameter. So that's very simple. But then we get to some much more sort of interesting wave shapes, like these swarm oscillators are really interesting. Where it stacks a whole bunch of sine waves or triangle waves. I mean, this is just like the most basic form of the sound, and readily that's kind of pretty rich and characterful sound. All the way to some sort of more weird and wonderful ones like chip, like a kind of a video game oscillator. Shepherd's Pie, which is a shepherd tone oscillator. It just kind of infinitely rises or falls in pitch. All the way to some things like top is kind of like a, almost like a kick drum type sound. So there's lots of really interesting um, sound generators in here. Let me go back to this dual basic shapes. Because um, this is also going introduce, to introduce us to something that's both new in Live 12 and uh, new in Meld itself. So this is a relatively simple oscillator we've got here. I've just got some shapes and I can detune two oscillators against one another to sort of create a richer sound. But you'll hear as I get a bit higher in the detune, starts sounding a bit wonky. 
So I can activate this feature that's uh, built into Meld and built into Live 12 called Scale Awareness. You'll see in the top right of the device, I have this little flats and sharps icon. So in previous versions of Live, we've had um, built-in keys and scales. You might be familiar if I go into a MIDI clip, we have this section over here where I can set a clip to be in a particular key, C minor. And that sort of helps me program particular notes. It shows me the notes that are in that, that scale when I'm uh, programming some notes in there, which we'll come back to in a moment. But now we have this globally in live. So I've got this new control where I can set the key and scale for my, my set. And that will reflect whichever clip I have selected, So because I set this one to C minor. And what that means is this global key and scale also applies across various different parts of live. So going back to meld, if I enable scale awareness in this device, meld is now aware of the scale that I've got set for my, my song. And different elements of the synth will tune to that scale. So again, here are those dual basic shapes without scale awareness. But when I turn scale awareness on, it sounds a lot more harmonious and in key. And now instead of just kind of detuning an arbitrary amount, you see how it detunes in degrees of the scale, which lets you create these kind of really musical uh, sounds. And so you'll notice that a couple of the different oscillators in um, MELD have this scale awareness. There's a number of other places it shows up in live, which we'll get to. So for example, the swarm oscillators. If I turn scale awareness off, sounds a little bit kind of detuned. I'll just turn that. Turn scale awareness on. And if I change to, I don't know, change to a major key. A bit more major. So it allows you to really have all these different elements of your song that kind of interact with your key in interesting ways. Let's go back to these dual basic shapes. Even some of the filters in Meld, I won't go into too much detail here either, but uh, also have scale awareness where you can do interesting things with the filters. So the real kind of uh, Headline features of Meld here are these interesting wave shapes. We've got the scale awareness. We've also got some interesting filter types. Um, for example, this. We've got this like this warm, distorted filter. And then all the usual stuff you'd expect from a synthesizer. You can go in and. But it just sounds pretty good. Hey everyone, I hope you've been enjoying this tutorial. At DBS Institute, we provide degree level training to help you take your skills to the next level and start your career in music production. Head to the link to find out more. So I'll go back into this clip and we can take a look at some of the other uh, generators that exist, these MIDI generators. So I've got nothing in this clip at the moment. I've set it to be in the key of, of C minor. Um, and these generators and transformers work with your key information as well. So when I'm generating notes, chords, things like that, it's going to follow along with whatever key I have set. I'll go over to the next generator, which is called Seed. So the way Seed works is you can set a range of pitches, a range of note durations, a range of velocities, um, the number of simultaneous notes you want to have play, and the density of those notes. And it's going to generate melodies for me. So I'm going to say I want to create a melody. So I'm going to only have one voice. I want it to be kind of between C3 and C5 is, is pretty good. I'll set it to be between 16th notes and 8th notes. And uh, yeah, kind of a little bit more dense than that. Maybe let's turn this down a bit. That's a, the C5 is a bit high. Let's go down. a bit dense as well. So it's generated a melody for me. If I don't like it, I just hit this button. Generates another one. If I want to generate a longer melody, I set my bar as long as I want it to be. Let's do two bars and hit generate again. And you can just keep doing that until you find something that you like. And of course, this is all just MIDI information. So you can get something that's kind of close to what you like and then go in and, and refine it a bit. 
So the idea with these generators is they're not just going to instantly come up with an idea for you, but they're going to help you discover new ideas that you might not otherwise think to come up with, or just kind of help jostle your creativity when you, you're stuck and you just need a bit of a, a boost. Uh, the range is a bit wide. Let's sort of restrict that a little bit. And maybe make it a little less dense. So we've just got a little bit of a melody. It's also really good for bass lines. If I just sort of quickly load up a, uh, a different sound here. And again, I'll just use seed, pretty much kind of roughly the same settings. Hit generate. I probably want to set the uh, notes to be a bit lower. Let's try some variations. So I've got this pattern. I want to make it a bit more interesting. I'll duplicate it. And then I can select the second half of this, go over to my transform tools. I'm going to choose one called uh, recombine. Recombine lets me take existing notes and just kind of shuffle them around in interesting ways. So just by dragging this here, you can see how it shuffles those notes. Extend it to be a two bar bass line. Maybe these two notes here are pretty far apart. Maybe I want to create something that sort of moves between those two notes. I can select those two notes and go over to the Connect Transform tool. And what that does is that fills the space between those notes with some additional notes. I can select the sort of timing of those notes. Do I want to have ties involved? Without me having to do anything, I've created a relatively interesting bass line here. Um, and obviously, you can spend a lot more time sort of doing some, some pretty fun and interesting stuff uh, with that. Uh, what you might have noticed is with both the transform, uh, transformations and generations, there's a Max for Live section. There are a handful of uh, generators and transformers that come built in to Ableton. But if you know anything about Max for Live, Max for Live is this uh, environment that lets anyone develop content for Ableton. These generators are open to Max for Live. So what that means is we're going to start to see, and we've already seen some third-party developers create these tools that generate notes directly in the piano roll. And there's like already some pretty nuts Max devices that people build. So I can't wait to see what people are going to build uh, for these. I know for myself, I tend to sit down, always play the same chord types, the same kinds of melodies. So if I can take those, play them in, and then use some of those transform tools to like, let's see where I can make them slightly different. So I found for myself, because I'm, I'm not particularly strong at music theory, like something like the, uh, this generator called Stax is the chord generator. Um, let's see. So Stax, you can set up uh, up to four different kinds of chords, and you can change the chord shape. And you'll notice though, and this, this is going to relate to another feature which I want to mention, is it doesn't give you sort of chord types here. It gives you these kind of little diagrams. But you'll see down in the bottom, it actually does tell you what the chord is in this sort of bottom bar. If I hover over there, it says C minor 7, uh, scale degree 1, 3, 5, 7, etc. I, th I think it just sort of creates this different way of, of thinking about the way notes combine together, the way chords work. I, I think if anything, it's going to help people um, more easily get attuned with these more advanced music theory concepts. It's just, it, they're more like helpers than I'm going to do the job for you kind of thing. With the seeds and the, and the new MIDI devices, um, are they like written by humans or is it because at least temporally it seems very pleasing? So. Um, you mean this, this generator yeah. seed? It's uh, actually just completely random. So there's some, something in the background that when you hit this, it generates this some kind of random seed that generates notes but restricts them within these parameters. So there's not there's no like predefined patterns that are being chosen from. Even with um, like this rhythm, it's all algorithmic. There's no like pre-written stuff in there. Um, it's all being generated kind of semi-randomly. So I wanted to um, just mention a couple other features. But there's two new features in Live that I think are really important features that are not necessarily going to apply to to everyone, but the people that they do apply to, they're pretty important. The first one is accessibility. So 
Um, Live 12 is now fully accessible to people who are blind or partially sighted um, and need to use some kind of screen reader or keyboard control to control the interface. So if I go up into the options menu here, you'll see there's this accessibility menu where you can have various parts of the interface spoken. Um, and then there's this new navigate toolbar, which essentially adds a whole bunch of uh, keyboard shortcuts for navigating the interface of Live even when you're not able to see it, so purely with a, a keyboard. So for example, by pressing Control-0, what you would have noticed there is it jumped to the control bar. It selected the control bar. Um, and there's this option here, use Tab key to move focus. When that's on, I can press the Tab key, and you can sort of see it there, is how it's moving between different parts of the interface. Essentially, the uh, result of this is that using nothing but a keyboard, you can navigate to different parts of the interface and control live entirely with the keyboard. So again, that's great for people who have accessibility needs, but also just for power users who want to get around with keyboard shortcuts, it's pretty cool. The other feature in here is something called tunings. The way that we are all used to creating music and the way that most uh, modern music making tools work is based on a very Western idea of what music is. We work in what's known as 12 tone equal temperament, where we've got the notes of the scale. Generally, octaves are pretty universal across different cultures. So an octave is essentially a note. If you double or halve the frequency of that note, you get an octave. But how the scale is divided up between those octaves, what are the ratios between the different notes, there are various different ways of approaching that. And 12 tone equal temperament comes from a sort of uh, Western tradition, and it's how um, most modern music software works, where you work in this, this particular division of the scale. But there are all these other tunings that exist from either from sort of experimental music, where people are trying different tunings, or from different cultures that historically have different ways of tuning their instruments. And so now, Live 12 lets you use those tunings inside of Live to retune your set. So let's use, um, just to kind of demonstrate this, I'm going to program in like what would be a, a C major scale. Cool. So it sounds like sort of very Western C major type scale. But we have all these tuning files that you can now use. And they use something called Scalar, which is a sort of universal standard for scale files. So there's a bunch of built-in ones, but there are like literally thousands of others that you can find online. There's tools for making your own kind of tunings. But I can find one of these tunings, um, and I can load them up. Just by double-clicking, you'll see it's loaded that tuning up. And those same notes sound very different because the ratios between those notes and the way the scale works is going to be slightly different. Um, and you'll even see what it does is it uh, adapts the piano roll to fit the kind of notation standard of whatever that tuning might be. So we've ended up with something like this E1 slash 2 flat 3. I personally don't know what that means, but it's obviously relevant to this uh, particular tuning system. Yeah, and it's as simple as just loading up a different tuning system. If you want to get rid of it, you just delete it, and it's back to the regular 12 tone equal temperament. You can even do things where you load up just actually a regular 12 tone equal temperament and change your reference pitch. I don't know if anyone here is a 432 hertz head. <laughs> You're into, into that sort of stuff. If you wanted to do that, you can change the tuning of your project to 432 hertz directly with these scale files as well. So that's something else that you can do with that. You'll see on the tracks themselves, there's this in the MIDI area, there's this bypass uh, tuning information. The way that it works, again, this is something that I'm not 100% certain on, but I believe the way that it works utilizes uh, MPE and the way MPE works to tune individual notes. So it will work with, it's going to work with all the built-in live instruments because they're set up to, to work with MPE. Um, with third-party plugins, you need to have a plugin that can accept MPE data, but then it will work with this uh, sort of tuning standard as well. But so yeah, you can set it then um, per track. You've got all these additional kind of controls for that. Um, and I believe, I don't think it's ready yet, 
Um, if anyone's familiar with Ableton has these micro sites, uh, there's like learning music, uh, learning synths, they're like these separate websites that they've got dedicated to certain topics. I believe they're working on one uh, dedicated to tuning systems. And does it change the keyboard layout if you were to go microtonal? Because I've seen some like microtonal instruments that have like extra keys. It, ch it changes the MIDI piano roll w with a particular MIDI controller. If you've got like a conventional keyboard based controller, um, it's going to be stuck with those keys. This is where something like newer controllers like the push become quite useful because this works with push as well because the push grid, if you're familiar with the Ableton push, is not sort of restricted to that sort of classical white keys, black keys layout. It works quite well with these tuning systems as well because it can adapt to, to be what sort of whatever. So I imagine things like the launch pad and those grid based controllers will be able to, to integrate this sort of stuff as well. We were kind of building a track here in the session view a lot of people do work in the session view. I personally like to start in the session view and move over to the arrangement view, but a lot of people don't use the session view at all. Nice little new feature for the arrangement view, mixer and arrangement. So you might have known before that when you're working the arrangement view, if you wanted to get like kind of a big fader, you could use, you've got track mixers over in the right chair, um, but if you wanted to get nice big faders, you'd have to swap over to the session view, bounce back. Now you've got the mixer directly in the arrangement view. You can see that all there. Also, what you'll notice is we have this thing called stacked detail views. So the detail view in live is this area down at the bottom where you sort of historically have either your notes or your instruments. Now you can have both at the same time. You can have both your notes and your devices. And if you're in the uh, arrangement view, you can have your notes, your devices, and your mixer. You maybe need a bigger screen than this, but you can have them all visible at once. Um, the stack detail view in particular is really cool for if you like are programming some notes in and you want to manipulate the sound and the notes at the same time, you can just have that there and you don't have to flick between the two. Or maybe I want to add some automation to this. Just right click, say show automation, boom, it's right there. I can see that control and I can go in and just add some automation right there while I'm seeing the device at the same time. Um, there's been a couple kind of, uh, I mentioned there's lots of little interface things. The way that the uh, clip view is laid out is slightly different. The notes, envelopes, and MPE tabs, which used to be over on the side here, are now up here. Just makes a lot more sense uh, when you start using it. It just sort of feels right. Yeah, I think that's, that's sort of all the kind of major new features. There's lots of little things. There's lots of fun, like little tiny features that if you, you are really into doing what that feature might do, they're pretty handy, um, like normalizing audio clips, some pretty nerdy stuff, but all pretty fun. One that I absolutely love, because I use it quite a lot, um, this is not going to be the best example to, to show it with. I'll just load up a, uh, maybe there's a loop I can use. So this is where the filters come in handy, because I can go, I want loops, not one shots. Let's grab a loop. There's usually an option, maybe it's in here. Yeah, normalize clip sample. So like that's something that, that I personally really enjoy having here because often you'll record something in or resample something and it's a little bit lower. If you just hit normalize, it basically normalizes. So this is a, a sample, so it's not going to work, but it normalizes all the peaks to zero. So that's like kind of a little audio editing thing. Kind of a big one, like a sort of a secretly big one, is uh, freeze and flatten track. So bounce in place is something that a lot of people are like, why doesn't Ableton have bounce in place? Ableton kind of has always had bounce in place with freezing and flattening, where you could right click, if you've got a MIDI track that's doing a whole bunch of things, it's got effects and you want to write it to audio, you could right click, freeze the track, then you have to right click again, flatten the track. Now you can just do that all with one command. So if I've got this, let's grab some MIDI here. If I've got this little bass line, and I want this to be flattened to audio so I can, I don't know, chop it up or reverse it or whatever. Right click, freeze and flatten, boom, there's my audio. I know for people who've used Logic, there's a lot more that you can do in there. It's not quite the same, but it's, it's sort of somewhat, yeah. Like freezing and flattening, normally does that include all the, the effects you've got on that channel? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. It's exactly the same as, as if a normal freeze and flatten. Um, and you can still just do freeze, because sometimes you just want to freeze a track to save a bit of CPU power or something. But yeah, if, if I had effects and things on here, all the MIDI dates, all the instruments, just gets rendered to, to audio.
you might have been familiar with in the past. So Command U is the shortcut for quantize. So if I select all of these, these notes, I press Command U, snaps it to the grid. Uh, previously, if you pressed Command Shift U, you would get the quantize settings, which lets you set things like quantize amount. So if you don't want to quantize it exactly to the grid, you could say 50%. But the way that works is you'd have to sort of you go 50%, apply it, ah, oh, it's too much, undo, do 40%, apply it. Now, if you hit Command Shift U, it actually takes you to a, a transform tool, which is quantize. And that lets you apply this quantization in real time. So as that's playing, you can just dial in exactly how much. So if you're like, that's a bit too loose. Just dial it in and just kind of listen. And you can set, do you want the end of the note, the start of the note, both. Also, humanize. So if this was fully quantized, if I sequenced it, you don't need that. You can just humanize the notes. Again, just like dial in how kind of wonky or not wonky do you want it, which is pretty fun. So that's a new thing, is the humanize. Does that override the groove tool? Um, so no, it'll, it'll apply the grooves, because the way the grooves work is, it is always applied on top. So like if I had notes here, um, grooves do get applied on top of that. There's probably some kind of complex math happening as to how exactly it shifts it. But you can apply, before you could do, um, the way you would sort of do this kind of real-time quantization is actually using grooves, is if you load up a, a groove, any groove, um, and you, you turn the timing off, you can quantize there, and you could kind of listen to it and hear how much it was quantizing but you, you couldn't see the notes moving. Um, and then the, the timing of the groove would be applied on top of that. Um, so it, yeah, it's not gonna mess with the, the groove pool stuff at all. So there's been a couple improvements to, uh, to Max as well. So just on the sort of front end side of things. So you might have been aware of the LFO before. Um, so the way this used to work is you would map it to, let's say I map it to the filter, and I can no longer access that control. It's completely taken over by this LFO. There's a new way that these modulators can work, which is called mod, where instead of taking over that control, they just apply modulation around that control point. So you still have, so this is much more like how an actual modular synth works, where you still have control over that, you can just dial in a range around that. I kind of, I'm not totally in love with how they've done it. It would make more sense if the actual, the blue was just in the range it was going, not from the, I kind of, I get why they've done it that way. But it has but, a bipolar setting as well. Okay. Yeah. I was scared that it was only, only bipolar, not unique. Yeah, well, I mean, it's sort of, it, it is working in, bipolar, in a bipolar way, but the way that the control is yeah, displayed is, is a bit confusing. But you can set it to be like unipolar. Um, so that's pretty handy. There's a, the, a couple updates to the LFO as well. So like you've got this, these extra wave shapes like Stray, um, which is pretty handy. Internally in Max for Live, anyone who's building Max devices, they've really simplified the process the way that this kind of mapping works in Max. Before, in order to build a device, if you wanted to build a device like this LFO that had a map button that you could click on, there was all kinds of steps that you had to do. You got to query the live API and then tell it the ID of the device and then et cetera. They've made a new max object, which is just called like live.map, which you just load that up, connect the control that you want to be able to map and, and there you go, like super easy. There's a bunch of other really cool MIDI transform tools like Strum. I know Strum is a big one that people love that lets you kind of strum uh, chords. So like if I select those and let's go to strum super cool so just you can sort of adjust that arpeggiate as well arpeggiate's pretty cool so like i can take chords um oh, let's just quantize those back to the there and just like real time arpeggiate the notes Which is pretty fun. The other thing I didn't actually mention, uh, I mentioned the scale awareness in terms of meld. The MIDI effects, um, a lot of the MIDI effects have been updated to incorporate the scale awareness. Also, uh, two MIDI effects that have had a particularly big update are arpeggiator and scale. 
if anybody's used these before. The scale device was great, but a bit of a pain to use because in order to set the scale type, you had to like use a preset. Um, it was a very confusing device to configure. That's been updated so that now you literally just choose your scale type from this menu and it's got all the ones that you want and it's kind of configured. And you can also set up scale awareness where it just will follow your global scale. Arpeggiators had a redesign and that's gonna follow the, you can set that to be scale aware as well. Where that's kind of interesting with a lot of these MIDI devices is something like random. But the way random works is, so I'm just playing a C now, and it's, but it's randomizing the, the pitch of the notes that I'm playing. There you can hear it's completely random, not in key. Whereas if I make it scale aware, it's gonna randomly generate notes, but only in the scale that I've set. So you can do lots more really interesting kind of generative things with these the MIDI tools and the scale awareness, um, which is pretty fun. There is also actually a new MIDI device called CC Control. Uh, before you had to use Max for Live to do this, but if you are working with any sort of external hardware and you wanted to like record automation that you sent out as CC messages, um, before you had to use Max for Live devices to do that, now there's just a native device that lets you do that um, and you can set up what sort of MIDI message you want to send and then you've just got this control that lets you control external hardware, which is pretty, pretty cool, pretty handy. So that was my talk on what's new in Live 12. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find more content, check out DBS on YouTube.